What's going on, everyone? I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle alongside Robert Cessna, of course. We're here in Nashville, SEC Media Days. It's the kickoff to the football season. Uh, Cease, we heard from A&M yesterday, heard from a lot of other schools between yesterday and today, but we're going to focus mostly on A&M. What was your just initial thoughts and takeaways from uh, what Jimbo Fisher and the players had to say here in Nashville? Well, obviously, everyone's talking about the offense. You know, how's Bobby Petrino fit in? Some of the guys, I have to laugh, when you listen to other media sometimes, they're kind of surprised that only two defensive players came in one offense because there's so much focus now on the offense. But if you're Jimbo, who would you bring? There's no running back. You can't bring a quarterback. And I kind of thought, eh. and you mentioned maybe Max Wright, which, you know, he's been a, a good guy around. Because offense is what people want to talk about. And I know it's, it was a tragedy with Terry Price, people talking about the defense. But right now it's all about, you know, what's – Bobby Petrino in the offense, and Anaya Smith gave, gave a lot of good comments. Some of the defensive players talked to it a while. But even today, you run into people and some of the media that maybe we didn't touch base with yesterday on the first day. First thing they talk about is, how's Jimbo and Bobby? Right, and so a lot of questions yesterday on what that offense is going to look like, what's the, the roles Bobby Petrino is going to hold, whether that's play calling, things like that. A lot of questions not a whole lot of answers from Jimbo Fisher, and it, it makes sense. I know a lot of people are kind of criticizing how many questions were asked about Bobby Petrino in the offense, but we haven't really gotten answers to those yet questions yet, have we? No, and it's a fair question because once again is, and I get it. I know you're on Paul Feinbaum's show, and you might want to talk a little bit about that. You know what what Paul had to say because you know everybody does pay attention mm -hmm. to what Paul said. But even some of the national columnists that are here, you know. Uh, you know, Kirk Bowles is here from the Statesman, you know, getting you know, some of the Texas people on media is here getting ready for when Oklahoma name could be. And it's a basic question, and the fact that Jimbo doesn't answer it kind of adds more intrigue to it mm -hmm. because the Missouri coach said he's going to be the offensive co co coordinator. He's not going to call the plays. The, the Mississippi State defensive coordinator, who's now the head coach, says, you know, I'm not calling plays anymore. And, and I get it. But Jimbo also says, well, I don't want to say anything, but, you know, because people might, it's almost saying like someone might get a, a, a key on what we're doing, which is not the case. And it's just, it's created more of a buzz and should it. it Maybe uh, Jimbo's smarter than all of a sudden he wants that buzz. And of course, uh, talking to the Arkansas people up here that we've, we did before, on, even on this podcast, but, you know, Bobby Petrino is such a private person anyway going back to his coaching days he loves obviously not meeting us so you don't have that but it's just a, a such a dynamic that man you wonder what's going to happen and here we are like what 47 46 days from first game against uh, New Mexico we don't know yeah with um, w with what uh, Bobby brings to the table and what Jimbo brings to the table um, it, it, we even ask a little bit about scheme and is it going to be maybe a little bit more of that under center pro set is it going to be a little bit more of the spread of what uh, Bobby has we, we, we don't really necessarily know much of anything and and I, you know it's it's interesting to, to know how much do they really think they, they know about uh, what's going to go on? I, it's just a really interesting situation all around and something that we're probably not necessarily going to get solved until we see them on the field in the fall. Let's be honest. It gets back to A&M's underachieved two years in a row, and that's kind of the overriding deal. We walked around, and everybody were trying to get the players, and I was not surprised, but a couple times I heard – other riders from other beats asking the NM players, well, you know, how do you, why do you underachieve? You know, you guys have the facilities and whatever, and that's kind of, you know, the good and bad of AM. AM wants to be a national top 10 power year in, year out, but it hasn't happened. And so you get those questions that when you pay 90 some million dollars for a coach, you know, once again is, if you go to the best steakhouse in Bryan College Station, you don't want to get Whataburger food or, you know, you don't want to get Burger King. And don't get me wrong, I go to both those places, whatever. But I'm just saying is I don't expect to 
drop 40 bucks at Burger King for a burger. Right. Well, you know, and, and the interesting thing to me is you look back and, you know, Nick Saban, of course, a mentor to, to Jimbo and a lot of guys in the SEC. You go back to what many people have talked about in Nick Saban when Hugh Freeze brought in that up-tempo offense to Ole Miss several years ago. He brought, he, he brought in Lane Kiffin, and he was normally like a guy who wanted his offense to be ball possession to help his defenses run, but he changed courses and, and did something different, and everybody praised him for being an innovation an innovator and and changing his approach and everything like that doesn't it seem like if Jimbo would have attacked this head on and said, hey, this is uh, this is what we're going to do. He's going to call plays. This is what it's going to be. And if it is successful, then everyone praises Jimbo for being an innovator in the same way. Yeah, because it's kind of funny, Travis, because, you know, you pick up a little bit of things from everyone, which I think whether you're a writer or whether you're a fan, you should do that as well. And then you look and Jimbo said something that's very Apropos, it's, you know, we know Nick Saban's a defensive coordinator, great guru, and uh, Kirby Swarney says, you don't think Kirby and, and Nick Saban hops in there once in a while on defense? That's probably true, but once again, they've won. They're winning every year, and Jimbo has not produced the championships that he said he came here to win, and he hadn't been close. Now, you can say go close one year, let's be honest, nine and one. They were number five. But, you know, that's one of those deals that has an asterisk. That was a COVID-shortened year, you know. It, it was Did he prove to be the top five? Yes, but it was only one out of five. You know, once again, it's you're not you're, you're not paying Burger King, or King money. You're paying, you know, the, the old days gone back to people who remember, uh, it, you know, the best steakhouse. I forgot the name now on Bryan County Station. I'm too old. Republic keep, or Christopher's. Well, or, God, well those are yeah. good ones for now, but I was, I was trying to think of the other one. But that's. But my point being is, and then winning solves everything. You come today, and what I said to Travis last night, when we were kind of, you know, we always, we, or like anybody else, we talk for a trip. And I said, man, I just didn't think there was that many people yesterday there. And you go, well, it's the first day. It's only three people. I said, yeah, but it's A&M and LSU. That's a pretty good twosome. Today, man, they showed up for Georgia. It's mm-hmm. amazing what winning will do, and I think it'll be that way tomorrow for Saban. And I think that's what fans want. And even Jim Fisher said one of the things he talked to everybody is he wants to reward three people, his first-year play- players, the fans, his staff, whatever. He hadn't done that yet. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why everybody is a little bit edgy. I don't know what's the right word to use for AM fans right now, but it, it, it can't be happy. They've had eight and four and five and seven. Sure. Uh, some things we did were able to glean about the offense is the fact that the the two defensive players that were here, McKinley Jackson and Fidel Diggs, said through spring practice, they saw a lot of swagger in AM's offense under now Bobby Petrino. And I asked Anaya Smith, well, where does that swagger come from? And he, he did raise a good point. He said that when Jimbo was both the offensive coordinator, you know, the play caller and uh, the head coach, if there was routes run the wrong way, if there was little things that needed to be tweaked here or there, he might say, you know, get on the guy or something and say, we need to work on this. We need to, I need to talk to you about this. But he wears so many hats. He was bouncing around. He might not have actually gotten back to that player to go over what was wrong. But with Petrino's kind of running the show and Jimbo sitting back and kind of watching things from a 35,000 foot view, Petrino there is there to correct, uh, you know, run the route this way, throw the ball that way, things like that. But when Jimbo wanted to come back and talk to a guy, he has a little bit more of an opportunity to do that. He can pull him aside there and kind of offer a little bit. So they're getting that kind of double instruction that we weren't getting before. One of the things that Anaya Smith said. And then another thing that uh, I think Fadil Diggs said uh, yesterday is the fact that they've been working a lot faster. I think Jimbo Fisher took a lot of, of, of heat last year for uh, how long it took AM to get to the line of scrimmage and then snap the ball uh, and they're working quickly between the snaps uh, they said under Petrino so little bits and pieces that we did get about the offense but not a whole lot of direct answers uh, from Jimbo Fisher uh, Cease what else um, stood out to you maybe from some of the other teams we've uh, talked to or um, other little side conversations that we had with a and players well you know talking to AM players it's just uh a couple of them were asked about Texas and Oklahoma joining it, and that's kind of a, a weird thing just because, like, Anaya Smith probably won't get the chance to participate in that. And these players, uh, we laughed afterwards, some of us old hairs walking away and talking, go, well, you know, 11, 12 years ago, these guys were 9, 10, 11 years old. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, 
I'm 70, it's hard to remember what I was thinking when I was 10 years old. So ask it, and I think Kirby Smart hit on it. Somebody said, well, hey, Minnesota won th the last one to win three in a row, and that was like in 30, because we want something a little more relevant to our players, even though you have everything at your fingertips uh, on your on your phone, uh, it still has to be somewhat current. And I think that gets back to it, because never more with transfer portal, whatever, People want to win now. And, and talking to the AM players, talking to, you know, Anaya Smith came back to win. You know, he came back. He didn't come back for NIL deals, but he came back for what he thought was the best fit. You know, he wants to win. He wants to be a leader. And yes, I'm sure NIL played a part in it, whatever, but that, that's way on anybody. But right now, everybody wants to win now. You mentioned the age of some of those guys the last time that Texas and Texas A&M played. Uh, you know, another interesting little tidbit that came out uh, that we'll, we're doing a story on here a couple days is uh, Anias Smith's relationship to his older brother when his older brother was getting recruited. Uh, part of that story was the fact that his whole family uh, was at a recruiting visit when Texas A&M played Texas that last time uh, on the field. And we can write a little bit about that. You know, here, here's the funny thing. It was talking to his mom. Uh, Anais was wearing a UT t-shirt in the A&M recruit section the whole time. And his parents thought that was hilarious that he was uh, going out on a limb like that. And then Bobby Petrino recruited his brother both out of high school and in a transfer uh, situation. We got to talk to his family about that. We'll have a little bit more on that to go uh, this week. Cease, you've done a lot of uh, of media days, like like a lot, like a whole lot of media days, like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like a lot of media. No, uh, how is? I'm just curious. You know, a lot of people sometimes ask about the kind of behind the scenes of what this looks like for us. How have you seen uh, media days evolve and change over the years to where we are now here in in Nashville? Well, there's so much media now because of dot com. You're, you're amazed at who the media is and who the media is. And luckily, because of our paper, we can touch with our Tulsa paper. We touch with our Auburn paper and yourself, meaning the young journalists coming up, which is nice to see. But also, I, I rub shoulders, you know, with, uh, as I mentioned, Kirk Bowles is here, Wally Hall from the Arkansas Democrat, Bob Holt, who, mm -hmm. you know, you got the old crew, you got the new crew. Uh, SEC, nothing beats it. You know, now they're going to think about next year, if God willing, if I come back, uh, you know, in, we'll be in Dallas. But you add Texas and Oklahoma to this conference, 16 teams. You talk about, that's just amazing. But it's a show. It is a show. Uh, the coaches realize it. The players realize it. There, there's not a lot of information that – comes out of here a lot of times. Uh -huh. But yeah, you find out who might have got run off. There's enough. There's enough to make it worthwhile. There's a lot of news. We've we've known a lot in the last uh -huh. couple of days. Uh, Smokey Bowie, uh, how are you? Him, Smoke him, Bowie. Him, him too. <laughs> He's not at Georgia. Well, you, you learn stuff and you freeze, you know, coming back. That was that was kind of interesting. There's a guy that come back that was gone. And so there's a lot of news here. There's a lot of personalities here. Uh, you know, it, it's it's an event that it's not really for the fans. It's for the it's for the players, it's for the coaches, and it's for the media. And mm -hmm. sometimes And a lot for TV. And a lot for TV. Mm -hmm. A lot for TV. And sometimes the media don't agree with each other. And that's kind of what I like. Because the print's better, know the electronics better, know the instance better. Let's be honest, the fact that there's so many, even dot coms we haven't heard about and you, you might question them, and I go, did that guy just ask that question? That's a stupid question like I would, <laughs> like I would ask. But my point being is, never has there been more information being distributed from any kind of these. Because coach makes a bad joke or, or tells a good joke, it's out there. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned a good point. The SEC, uh, SEC Media Day is going to be in Dallas next year, the year that Texas and Oklahoma enter the uh, SEC. Kind of maybe rubbed a few Aggie fans a little bit the wrong way that they've been in the SEC for so long and not a whole lot has come this far west until the Longhorns and the Oklahoma City. Do you see it that way? Do you see it was just an opportune time? What, what's, what's your kind of take on is it as much ado about nothing? I am a conspiracy type guy. Okay, you know, <laughs> Anna's been in the league 12 years, okay? And uh, Anna was a big coup for the SEC because the SEC wanted to go in to Texas. They add Missouri as well. 
okay, A&M was in the league, and I, I think, I firmly believe, being in the SEC long enough, I don't necessarily buy that everything rules in favor of Alabama, even though you have to ro- wonder about a lot of things. It's just, it just seems sometimes the big dog does get a lot of wags, so to speak. But I think, you know, Vanderbilt, in a lot of things, has the same vote that everybody else, but I'm like you. I mean, I'm like myself saying, okay, as soon as Oklahoma and Texas come in, oh, they'll go to Dallas because all oh, now there's A&M and Missouri's close. You got five, Arkansas. Okay, Arkansas loves Dallas. As soon as A&M went in, why not have been into Dallas before? Because that would make sense, Arkansas, Missouri, and A&M. No, Texas and Oklahoma. And you, Okay, I got to say, that's a li- I, I think that's a little slap in A&M's face because it should have come before because Texas, they wanted Texas and I don't think A&M got enough out of that deal. Yeah, and to be fair, we've heard rumblings about the SEC looking at Dallas or Houston for SEC media days since really they announced the first one that moved away from Birmingham and Alabama to uh, Atlanta back in 2018. So it's been a while that we've heard rumblings, but it is now that it happens. And I, I, you know, maybe I'm making too much of this, but it should be noted that they're deciding to go to Dallas and go right heads up against the MLB All-Star game that's going to be in the Metroplex as well at the exact same time. Uh, that, that's a, spreading a lot of DFW media thin. Yeah, and let's be honest. I like Nashville. I've been here a few times. Love Nashville. you got Vanderbilt and Tennessee. Okay, you got two. They've been here always, and they get it in, like, Texas – over there, Arkansas over there, nothing close to Arkansas, nothing close you know, to Missouri now for 11, 12 years. Why not go to a St. Louis or Dallas if they want to pony up? You know, I'm or, saying, or even like a New Orleans. Or even New Orleans. Yeah. But you know, none of that happened. But Oklahoma and Texas is coming in. It, it, I'm sorry, it does look a little fishy. Sure. <laughs> One more thing to talk about before we get out of here, and that is actually the fact that on the way down here, uh, on the way to Hobby Airport, if we flew over here, we had the opportunity to stop down at the Texas oh, High School Coaches yeah, Association. Point. It was really fun for me to get to walk around there with you and kind of you inadvertently holding court with all the people who recognized you and wanted to come and shake your hand from the time that you've spent in, in high school football. For those of you who don't know, well, first off, we went there because uh, A&M had a, a person there speaking, and we got to hear some other college coaches speak to, to kind of build up the notebook a little bit. But uh, for those of you who don't know, what is the Texas High School Coach Association coaching a school, and, and how, how big of a deal is it? Because it's something you've been to for, for years and years and years and years. Years. When I first started, loved to go to coaching school because every coach, and let's be honest, it was the male coaches, the football, baseball, they were always there. They're there for a week, whether it was Dallas, Fort Worth, whatever. They go to clinics. Uh, they go there to go to eat at the best food restaurants at, at the at the school's dime or whatever. You go cover them. There were two All Star games: basketball, football. If you had a kid kids from your area in, it was a great honor. It was a great three days. College coaches would come and visit. First time I met Jim Wacker was at Texas High School. A lot of the college coaches I met for the first time, Ron Meyer, all of them at Texas High School Coaches Association in a small room. But then what happened? Believe it or not, coaches didn't want their kids playing about 15, 20 years ago. Oh, so-and-so got hurt. I remember Jimmy Shelby, uh, Randy Sip, some other A&M recruits got hurt in the game. And then suddenly coaches said, hey, my future's there. I can't have that guy get hurt in the All-Star game. So more and more kids were left out, held out. They eventually canceled the football games. But the coaches still go. And this year, I have to get brushed up a little bit. I think they've added a lot more women showed up. When I went, the last time I went, I want to say there was 11 or 12,000 coaches there. And let's be honest, these are the guys and gals that a lot of times are babysitting your kids. They're giving your kids their character, they're help bringing them up, they're helping discipline them, and they're doing it for a little bit of nothing, a lot of them. Yeah, a lot of coaches make six figures, football coaches, but the 22,000 coaches that were probably in Houston, less than 1% of them were making six figures. A lot of them were out making. And the fact they added the women this year, our first coach I saw was Coach Davis, at, I think at College Station, and that's something that I've covered recently, volleyball. I know more about volleyball, than, but anyway, I commend all high school coaches. And the fact that Mac Brown goes down, Shane Beamer was there saying the same thing. They're the lifeblood of sports. Any high, and the Texas has by far 
the best high school coaches. Yeah, you know, like you said, a lot of college coaches come down to mix and mingle and rub shoulders with these high school coaches. You had Shane Beamer from South Carolina going down there before coming here to SEC Media Days. You had Mac Brown, uh, North Carolina, former Texas coach coming back. Uh, you, had, you had Sarkeesian, uh, Dana Holgerson the next day, Joey McGuire from Texas Tech. All the, the biggest coach, Elijah Robinson, represented a and uh, instead of Jimbo Fisher. Uh, and, and so why is it important and what is the, the, the value of these college coaches coming to rub shoulders with those high school coaches? Because I think a, a lot, uh, there's a lot of conversation with that, especially with Jimbo Fisher sending Elijah Robinson instead of himself. Well, what is the importance of, of making those connections and being visible in that forum? Because it's an it's a, it's a organization with a, with a lot of sway. All those coaches one day see themselves as being the next Kirby Smart, the next Nick Saban, maybe the next uh, Andy Reid, but they also see themselves, we're, leading, we're turning boys and girls into men and women. And we see them go on at the collegiate level and have success, and then go on to college, NFL. That started at a small high school. I'm sure, and I think I can tie this in, Miles Garrett, who's one of the nicest mm -hmm. guys, I'm sure he loved his high school coach just as much or more than all his, all his NFL and high school coaches, and that's, I mean, co college coaches, and that's the way it is. I've known a lot, the Rod Bernsteins of the world, whatever. And you, they, you met Bob Wager, which is Miles Garrett, Wager, who's now at uh, Nebraska. Who I did a lot of times through emails, and a lot of them go on and become college coaches. But the good coaches remember where they came from. They remembered they were out there. Spike Dykes, he started out, all those guys started out as, as high school, most of them started out as high school coaches and they understand how important it is. And they want to be just as successful as the Kansas City Chiefs are. And they want to do it the right way. It doesn't matter who they are. Sure. Well, that's all the time we have here in Nashville. We'll be here the rest of the week. So check theeagle.com uh, for that e-edition and all the uh, content we have coming up from here. Uh, and uh, we'll be back and getting ready for that football season, uh, which is right around the corner. So for Robert Sesson, I'm Travis Brown. Thanks so much for watching.